Good afternoon everyone and welcome to YesTV. My name is Veronica, this is Aiden, and we also have Chris, Jennifer and Eamon. We are from Marylands High School and we will be hosting YesTV over the next two days. YesTV is a live stream from the Youth Eco Summit. Over the next hour we will be interviewing some special guests to learn about sustainability. Stay tuned as we bring you stone tools, eagles nests and many cool sustainability projects. You can join in on the conversation and ask questions through our social media. Tweet us at yes21stc with comments and any questions that you want answered. Let's hand over to Eamon and the girls. All right, thank you, Veronica. I have Ishra and, and Danelia, sorry about that, from TIGS. And I also have Ella and Lizzie from Terra. Hi, last year you've been working on a small project and this year you've been putting those projects into action. Could you please tell us a bit more from that? Yep, so the focus of our project was on our local rainforest, Minamar Rainforest in Buttery National Park. And we looked at, from fieldwork and undertaking surveys, um, the supposed impacts of climate change on the rainforest. So we noticed that there are a lot of vulnerable species at the rainforest and also that a lot of um, the community values what should be protected, as in the flora and fauna and the Minamar River. So we propose a lot of solutions um, and Tanali will tell you guys a bit more about that. So this year was all about putting our inspiring solutions into action. So, but we did this by um, having an event at our own school, the Illawarra Grammar School, where the new National Parks and Wildlife Services um, Authority um, came to our school and we talked about our inspiring solutions, which were um, putting quotas on the park, um, putting environmental flow managements in there, um, also that the biodiversity and the water could be protected. So it was all about getting our issue out into the community and then solving those issues. So Tara's project was marine parks. Um, we had, we got, sorry, we researched marine parks all across Australia, but we focused on the marine park at Cabbage Tree Bay at Shelley Beach Manly. Um, the year above myself and Lizzie, uh, they did all the secondary research, so they researched all there is about marine parks around Australia and what impact humans have and what the environment is doing to marine parks. And uh, myself and Lizzie, and other girls in our year, we went and did the primary research and we went snorkeling to discover what is actually happen happening in marine parks and what the difference is between the marine parks and non-marine park areas. So, yeah. So what we found was that um, boffs, big, fat, old, fertile fish, were actually really important to the marine environment. Um, and so to do this, um, to promote this, we decided to do um, the Blue Wave Challenge which is um, us, well, so the Blue Wave Challenge is where we do um, challenges in schools. So you can do um, like a big Mexican wave or anything like that. And then you post it on social media and you put hashtag Blue Wave Challenge. And this is to put the message across about how um, these boffs are really important to marine environments because they're fertile and they help, um, they produce um, more fish and help the environment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that information. Now I get that used to uh, um, used for in different schools, but in researching different types of environments. Uh, yeah, used to um, use for um, used for girls are in are researching search um, researching something quite similar but entirely different. Used to um, from Tiggs, I uh, was researching about re um, rainforest, and you um, two girls from Terra are researching about marine parks. So you two um, from TIGS are re um, researching by yourselves and you two fr um, from Terra are researching by yourselves. Is this hard or not? Uh, well, actually, we started off in a big group of about seven of us and then we moved to about three of us and now it's just us two. So I guess working in a small group like of seven and bring it down to two was actually quite good. So we could listen to each other's ideas. We met quite a lot. Um, it's quite good and easy visiting the rainforest so often when it is a small group, so we found that to be quite useful. 
So it definitely was a challenging experience, um, especially trying to implement our solutions this year when we had our exams and going into year 12. But it's just proven to be so rewarding. So the, uh, the challenge has paid off and we are so glad that we have done it. So like TIGS, we started off as a group, but we kind of stayed as a group. So we had two geography elective classes who, who participated in this. And we all got specific roles that we had to do. So the, the workload was separated, which made it a lot easier. Um, if we didn't have the like different roles we had, it would have been a lot harder. Um, we, yeah, we worked a lot together to get all the research done in the time we had. So yeah. All right. Now, if I heard correctly, I heard that you are heading into year, um, year 12. Yeah, so pretty sh soon you are joining the workforce. Um, for your job, would you be um, trying to like help the environment um, that you have chosen? Well, from this experience, we have learned about ourselves that we are passionate about it. So um, whatever career we pursue, um, we think that it will definitely influence us, whether it's not as a career path or whether it's just in our daily life. So um, just implementing things um, that can help conserve the environment will definitely be a part of us in the future. Okay, so this project has um, definitely um, inspired me to be more conscious about our environment. And I think, yeah, it, well, before this project, I didn't really see myself as doing anything um, in terms of, like, uh, geography or biology, anything like that. But after this project, um, I've started to think, well, maybe I will be, like, a marine biologist or study this because I really enjoy it. And it's been really a rewarding experience. Yeah. Marine bio biologist, sounds interesting. Um, Chris, Jennifer, do you have anything you might want to ask? Alright. Last year you presented um, your work at the World Parks um, Congress. Like, what was it like? Yeah, so all of our field work and surveys and strategies that we propose essentially accumulated to what we presented at the World Parks Congress last year in November. And there we were lucky enough to have our work listened to um, by climate change analysts, people from all over the world um, that are willing to make a change and conserve these protected areas against the supposed impacts of climate change. So in that it was really good that people were actually willing to hear young people's ideas about what could happen in the future and how we might protect um, our areas. So essentially what the IUCN World Parks Congress is, is um, it's a global forum on the protection of uh, ecosystems and environmental areas. So um, it was really good that we were able to experience that and um, in doing so we um, were able to see how what was it? Um, we, uh, the opportunities that came from it were huge and we just learnt so much and um, it's definitely been one that um, our, we know that we've been listened to, our strategies that we have um, implemented and suggested have definitely been um, like listened to by um, professionals and so to be they are essentially um, looking for innovative ways to protect the environment in which we live. So it was really good to be a part of that and know that we are making a difference somehow. So Lizzie and I, we didn't actually present at the World Congress. The, the girls from the year above did. Um, but we got the chance to go and watch uh, Tara's presentation and everyone else's presentation. Um, it was definitely a massive opportunity for us to see the difference that our projects could make and to see how like the girls uh, could make a difference from our projects that we did and yeah it was a really good experience for all of us. Yeah so because we weren't um, able to present ourselves um, 
I, like that doesn't didn't really matter because we still got to experience like the process of making it and we got to watch what it was um, like to present it and it was really rewarding um, and we learned a lot from this experience um, yeah All right, um, what, um, Chris, would you like to say something? Jennifer? I'm alright. Alright. So I get that you um, two are in two separate groups with two separate environments. And so I, so I have a bad feeling that you are deciding to see this as a very difficult job. Do you agree or do, um, don't you agree? Um, at first we did think it would be really difficult um, to do the field work, do the surveys, um, implement strategies and we did think it would be so difficult but over time like we realised that what drove us was our passion and that we really want to protect our rainforests and that the impacts of climate change are so real so that really helped us and it, it didn't really become difficult in the end actually. Initially it was hard having to give up our lunch times and classes, but all of it just paid off. Yeah, like they said before, it was hard at the beginning. Like we thought it wasn't doable because we were already so busy with school and work and sport or extracurricular activities. But as we got into it and we found out that we could um, give each like each person individual tasks and then put it all together as a group, we've like found out that it was actually quite doable. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I believe that everyone should follow their passion. And would you like to spread um, spread this rule to help our environment to schools and other people, young people, um, elderly? Do you actually feel the same? Yeah, I definitely think that people should open their eyes and look at the environmental, social, economic issues that we are facing today. And really, um, tr we, I really think that students especially should look at what issues we are facing today and look at how we can stop that or combat the issues that do affect us and will especially in the future like climate change. So what we learned was that the rainforest um, is such a crucial and intricate part of our local ecosystem. So we do definitely want to spread the word for how necessary it is to conserve these. So we hope to do that by going to events such as the Youth Eco Summit or, and the World's Parks Congress. Yeah. So we also think it's highly important for students to learn about the importance of the nat like the natural world, um, marine parks especially because they are a big and important part of our world because the world is basically made up of water. Um, a lot of the marine park, like a lot of the ocean, is damaged by human like human impacts, and we need to protect this as much as possible. So I think yeah, it's really important to make the natural world known. Okay, so um, if you want to contribute to like our like Blue Wave Challenge or their project as well, um, like you should you can um, do hashtag Blue Wave Challenge, do a video of yourself at, or at school doing a blue wave and spread the um, spread the issue and spread the awareness so that other people can understand that like marine parks and wildlife are really important to our environment. Uh, sounds very interesting. All right, I'm, I'm going to head this back to our anchors. Thank you for being on Yes TV and see you some, next time. All right, bye. <laughs> Thanks girls, that was a lot of effort and it's great to see people still helping out the natural environment. Let's move on to our next guest, Meadowbank Public School. But you know, first, we are living in the future of course. You know, in the famous movie Back to the Future, they actually travel to 2015. It's ironic, right? And it's quite amazing. But unfortunately, we don't have hoverboards or advanced medical stuff. But think about in the next 30 years, what we could do. Anyways, let's hand over to Chris, who's going to find out more.
Thanks, Aiden. Hey guys, I'm Chris, and I'll be one of your hosts for today. Um, so can you t guys tell me about your your project that you've been studying? At school, we've been studying plants and chickens. We've been doing. We've been looking after chickens for the past two years, and we've grown some plants and a whole lot of other things. Uh, yeah, it's been great. Um, yeah, a lot of fun. We've it's a lot of fun taking care of the chickens and all that. So. Um, so who started this project? So we had some crazy teachers five years ago, and they decided to say we could get some chickens. We've been cleaning out their poo, and every week. A different class gets to look after the chickens, and we have a memorial garden. Um, so, yeah, not much. Um, Hannah's basically covered it all, um, but it has been fun. Um, yeah. Sounds like a lot of work. So, have you guys got a plan for the chickens? Like, is there a reason you guys have chickens? Yeah. Um, we have, we used to have four chickens, but we have three now because one passed away and there's, and there's a plan for the chicken because they lay eggs and it costs $2 a carton because the school sells eggs to the parents. I think it was because, um, responsibility, like... Yeah, um, we wanted to have more responsibility in the school, so like each class each week gets to take care of the chickens, so. Sounds like a lot of, it's, it sounds like a great thing you're doing, but do you think other schools are able to do this project like you guys are doing? Yeah, it's pretty easy for the chickens, but it's pretty easy, but it's easy to look after the chickens, but it does mean a lot of responsibility because you do have to clean out the poo, water, and food. Wow, that's, that's a lot of work. So, how, how do you, does it, do you guys grow vegetables? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, how long does it take the vegetables to grow? Over, uh, a few months, a few weeks, possibly. Um, it takes a while, but it's worth it, like, because um, we cook it in our canteen, um, and yeah, so it's fun. And so, do your chickens have names? Yeah, our chickens do have names. We have Sticky Beet, Chicken Nugget, and Sushi. Those are some pretty silly names. Um. The, does your does the eggs and the vegetables go to your school canteen? Well, the ESL they they harvest the vegetables and the eggs are for the parents who pay money to get the eggs. I see you've got a step on the monitor. Yeah. I see you've been cheating on it as well. Maybe. <laughs> you guys got any questions for him? You guys are so cute. I can't believe you. Oh my god, can I steal them? Alright, sweet. Alright, you guys come home with me. Anyway, how do you distribute your vegetables among your school? We don't really dis distribute the vegetables among the school because not many of the classes get to taste the vegetables. Mainly the ESL eats them or something like that. Um, we, well, we sell them. Like, we have... Um, some Fridays we sell them, so off to the parents for about dollar, two dollars, maybe three. Um, um, we like to spend the money on chickens, um, so the chickens just feel at home and they, um, yeah. So, yeah, so you guys take care of them, uh, uh, that's correct, yeah? So what happens to them over the holidays? Over the holidays, you can sign up for chicken duty, and if you if the chickens lay eggs, you can keep the eggs. Um, well, it's really fun to like get 
parents and young kids to help around and with the chickens and uh, in the holidays as well. Like, awesome. Um, you guys are really good. I love your um, your enthusiasm with this project. Thanks for coming on to the STV, guys. Awesome. Um, back to Aiden and Veronica. Oh. Thanks, Chris. What an interesting project from Meadowbank Public School. Sounds great place to learn. Let's give Meadowbank a round of applause. I'm now going to pass on to Victoria. Centennial Parklands, Park who will find out some more. Here's some more facts. Did you know that recycling one aluminium can saves enough energy to run a TV for three hours? Wow, really? That's a lot of energy. It sure is. Imagine if everyone recycled aluminium cans instead of throwing them in the bin. We can save a lot of energy and the environment. So ask yourself, does your school have a system to recycle aluminium cans? If your school doesn't, it's a project worthwhile exploring. So, like I was saying earlier about technology being more advanced, oh, way, so is medication. Where are they? I don't know what to talk about. So, did you know that humans use up to over 80 billion cans nearly every day? I know, it's quite amazing. And it's something that we need to recycle. I know, I know. Can you turn to the back? Oh, sorry guys, we're having a bit of difficulties here. Turns out... I don't... So... Anyway... Turn to the back. Sing a song. Okay. So, let's go to um, our interviewers and see how their day has been so far. Hi, and welcome to STV. My name's Jennifer, and what have you guys been up to today? Um, today we've brought some uh, natural loose parts from uh, our parklands in Centennial Park and some clay and what we've been doing is giving uh, the kids an opportunity to put all those together and make some kind of artistic creation. That's really cool and now I see your name tag there, it's really nice. Thank you. Yeah, we do, we try to, um, basically all of our programs and education is based around what we can find around us. So we've got a really great bush classroom with lots of great leaves and seeds and plant material, sticks. So we do a lot of cubby house building, a lot of art making, a lot of creativity with nature. That sounds a whole lot of fun. But at this year's Youth, e Youth Eco Summit, you were showcasing a pro project called Nature Through Play. Can you please explain that a bit more? Yeah, so basically we think that play is something that is freely chosen um, and is child-centred. So. What we do is we just act as mentors to be there to help kids to explore nature um, in a way that they're interested in. So we're not there to sort of say, you need to do this, you need to be interested in that. We say, these are the materials, this is what you can do, go out and explore. Now that's really good because not all kids are interested in the same thing. Pretty good. On your website it says Centennial Park has apps to help them learn about parklands. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, so we've got an app that basically helps our park users. We have up to 20 million different park users a year. Anybody from people that walk dogs to ride bikes to uh, equestrian activities, sports activities, and as well as all the nature lovers out there. So what we need to do is we need to create an app to be able to get all the information we need out to our customers and our park users so they know how to use the park in a way that is... Um, sharing the space with all those other people and so they can also get a sense of the nature and the history of that site. Do you think this is really beneficial? Absolutely. Um, the, the app is crucial for us to get information out to, um, to, you know, not just the people that live by and near, use the park on a daily basis, but people all around the world that want to know about our site. Um, who do you think that this could be like aimed to? Um, well, at the moment, the app is really aimed at sort of the everyday park users, but there's also a section on there for heritage. It's the site of federation for Australia, so the signing of the federation agreement. So there's a lot of important history there. There's Indigenous history, um, and plus all the information that we have on there about our own education programs and all the great stuff that kids can do in the park.
All right. Well, that's lovely to have you. Um, thank you for being on Yes TV. And I know I've learned a lot, haven't we, guys? Yeah, me too. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye. Back to it. So let's go green with some more guests. I'm now going to pass on to the interviewers who will find out more. Thanks, Aiden and Veronica. Hi, I have a few, um, three girls here with me. Do you mind telling us your names and what you are doing right now? Um, I'm Hannah. Um, I'm Francesca. And I'm Alexia. And we're working with Go Mad to um, make a difference, pretty much. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty so, much. Yeah. Well, we're trying. We're building like a project within our school, like an environmental initiative. Yeah. Um, do you want to elaborate? What kind of project? Um, well, our project, we're doing this term, focuses on renewable energy, so we're trying to make our school more sustainable. We're going to do this through employing some um, energy-saving solutions and maybe some solar panels next year. Yeah. Alright. So how are you going to, um, con all right, with your solar power solutions, mind t and was it telling us a bit more about this, like most of our viewers might not know? Yes, well, Alexia has some um, information on. We had a, a guest come get Glenn Holiday talk to us about energy audits, and so Alexia knows some information about that. <laughs> so we were able to measure how much energy our school is using, and by that we were able to f um, have an aim for how much how much energy we want to reduce by in 2016. So that's 10% of our energy we want to reduce, and we can we were going to do that by having an energy efficient plan which Glenn Audit has helped us create. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, and I have one more question because we need, hu I'm hurry. Wasn't, um, actually no, Chris, do you have a question? Um, do you know how the solar panels work? Um, the solar energy, sorry? Solar energy? Um, your project. Project. Um, well, our major project isn't actually the solar panels because about five years ago or so we've already got them in. Um, so at the moment we're more working towards becoming an energy efficient school more than a renewable energy school. So at the moment we're working more towards um, uh, energy efficient light bulbs than the solar panel solar panels. <laughs> so yeah. Um, we're also trying to raise awareness throughout our school about turning lights off and different ways you can save energy. So that's more of our campaign. Yeah, so this is to reduce the, our CO2 emissions in our school. So we've also done worm farms and we're doing a mural at the moment. And also we're doing, like, we're planting trees so they can reduce CO2 emissions, so creating oxygen. And, yeah, so that's just our goals to reduce our carbon footprint at our school. Thanks for being on the, was it, the Yes TV. So, bye. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, and go green. Right, now we were speaking about recycling me. aluminium cans before and how much energy can be saved with the recycling of aluminium cans. Did you know that the amount of wooden paper we throw away each year can heat 50 million homes for 20 years? 20 years? Whoa, that's a lot of heating. It sure is. Exactly. This is why all schools should have a recycling system for wood, paper and cans. We're going to move on to our next guest now. Our next guest is from Chifley College. Chifley College has an agriculture and a horticultural component to their curriculum. Their current projects include poultry and hypoponics. I'll now pass on to Eamon who will find out more. Thanks, Adam. I have Chifley College here with me who have a project on chickens and hydroponics. Good afternoon and thank you for being on Yes TV. Could you actually tell us your names? Um, my name's Caitlin. Sarah. Stephanie. Tabitha. Tabakash. Luke. Jack. And I'm Mr. Giblin. Thank you. And I see you brought quite a lot of chickens. Could you mind telling us what you are doing with these chickens? Tabitha. 
Well, first of all, these are all chickens that we have at our school. We have got a number of different breeds here, and these actually demonstrate the different uses of chickens. So what we have uh, with Caitlin there, Caitlin has a, an Isa Brown, and that particular bird there is the bird that's used for most of the egg production in this country. Brown bird lays brown eggs, and so if you're into egg production, that's the sort of bird that's going to be laying your eggs. The other, of, uh, the other thing, of course, that we get from chickens is, is meat. And what Stephanie has here is a meat bird, or a broiler. And so this bird here, next time you drive into KFC or Red Rooster or get a barbecued chook from Woolies, that's the sort of bird that you're going to be consuming. The interesting thing about the meat birds, of course, is that this bird here is about three months old. Um, so they're bred to grow very quickly, uh, very fast. There's no steroids, no hormones used. It's just selective breeding to allow those birds to grow very big, very quickly. All right. and do these chickens actually have names? Short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Actually, I like to be in touch with my chickens. Anyway, what was that? Uh, what are the other few chickens that you have? You, uh, you told me about the brown chicken and the meat chicken. What are the other um, few chickens? Tabitha can give you a bit of a rundown on the, on the Aracana. Uh, the Aracana is a South American breed. It, um, it gives blue, chi blue eggs. eggs, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. That's all I know. Uh, this particular bird here, this is a Malay game. Of all the birds here, they're broken into two categories, the soft feather and the hard feather. The soft feather is birds, every bird here is a soft feather except for this one here. This is a game bird, and traditionally these birds would be used for fighting uh, or, or for, for game meat. Um, Jack's bird there. Jack, you've got the... Australot. Now, Jack's got the Australot, which is an Australian breed, and that particular bird was developed for both egg and for, for meat. And uh, Luke, you've got the... <laughs> Luke's a bit shy, but Luke's got the, uh, the Chinese silky, and that's a, uh, a fancy bird that was actually developed in, uh, in, in China. Uh, and Sarah? But I've got the Ancona. It's also a fancy bird. Yep, so the Ancona, again, is another fancy bird used basically for uh, poultry fanciers. The Ancona, this particular bird here is a bantam variety, which means it's a smaller, smaller variety. Um, Jennifer, you have a question? Okay, so on TV, I see these people dying these chickens. Could that potentially harm them? Sorry, what were they doing? Dying. Dying. Oh, dying. dying. Um, particularly with the silky breeds, they will actually colour them. They, you can actually dye the feather. And most, in most cases, usually f uh, harmless food dyes are used. So no, it doesn't harm the bird. It just adds a little bit of interest. Not something that we would generally do in agriculture, but it does, it does give you a, a rainbow-coloured bird. All right. Now, this is a qu um, question to the chickens. And besides the gang chicken, which one's actually the strongest? Hmm. Which, one, which one would be the strongest? Oh, I the be the, the strongest. Yeah, I reckon the meat bird would be the strongest out of all the chickens that we have. All right, you are. All right, mind giving us a demonstration? So with the Isa Brown, if you're not a professional, you can easily just hold it by the legs, which I've got, and then hold the wings so it doesn't fly off on you. Or when you're catching them, it's easier if you catch them by the legs and oh, hold them. Yep, this one's a bit. This one's a bit. Weird, but you hold them upside down so that like you can walk around with them. Okay. Generally, if you're handling chickens, generally if you're handling chickens, you'd basically put one hand underneath so that the feet go through the uh, through the fingers for the smaller breeds, and that way you've got a hand a hand free just to control the uh, the feathers on top. Uh, with the larger birds, of course, you'd basically just control either using a, a wing and a leg or, or just basically using both legs. All right. Well, thanks for being on Yes TV. Um, see you sometimes. Great chickens. Well, hope your project keeps running for many years.
Bye. Thanks. Now back to Veronica and Aiden. Thank you, Eamon. Those chickens were pretty interesting. Have you ever kept chickens at home, Aiden? Uh, no, but do cats count? I really don't think so. What about dogs? No. Snakes? Uh, you're getting a bit far. Uh, what about birds? Close enough. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. But no, I don't think we do have chickens. Maybe we can ask our school to set up a chicken run. How cool would that be? That'd be pretty cool. And chickens at school will be good for learning a variety of things. Now here's another interesting fact. Did you know that seven pounds of carbon dioxide is produced when one t-shirt is manufactured? This is as if you have driven a car seven miles? Wow, now that's a lot of CO2. But also, just to create a single t-shirt, you need 700 gallons of water. That's enough to fill 22 bathtubs. That's too much water. Also, one third of a pound of pesticides and herbicides are used to grow the cotton used in just one shirt. That's a lot. Well, that's heaps. What can we do to reduce this? Well, there's a lot of things that we could probably try and do, but I guess one thing is to just be resourceful. Don't throw your shirts away when you still need them. Try not to get them too dirty, so don't spray ink on your clothes like some people have done. I'm looking at you, Ali. Yeah, I kind of do that a, a few times, and it's really annoying. But also, even washing our clothes can be quite, you know, wasteful. So, without further ado, we're now going to talk to Western Sydney University. Western Sydney University has recently changed its name and got itself a new logo. The red looks really cool. We'll soon be chatting to Western Sydney University about the sustainability of textiles. Have you ever thrown out clothes because they are unfashionable or you grew out of them? Doing this is not environmentally friendly. So now we have Western Sydney University who's going to tell us more about their project on sustainability on textiles. We'll pass on to Chris. Thanks, Aiden. Hi, um, could you tell me your name, please? My name's Helen Angelakis and I'm the sustainability coordinator at Western Sydney University. Sounds like a big role. So could you tell me about this um, textile industry and what it's all about? Sure. Um, our workshop is about the um, impact on our planet um, environmentally and ethically uh, within the textile industry. So we talk about the different fibres that make up a fabric, whether it's a natural fibre or um, a non-renewable resource. We talk about the ethical side of the industry, which is um, the sweatshops, um, animal ethics, and we look at the waste, uh, the chemicals that are used in the production of the uh, fabrics, and we ask people to think about their uh, purchasing. Um. I hear that lots of big brand companies are using sweatshops at the moment, but um, some of them are switching to generic, normal ways of making textiles. So um, do you have any tips for young people at home to, uh, for textiles? Um, I think that we just need to be aware of the industry and we just need to think about when we uh, make a purchase. We can't uh, stop the big industries using sweatshops. It's a livelihood for those people in those countries. We just need to think about having um, a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. And we have, we all have our own voice and we can um, make and uh, ask people to listen to what we've got to say and to try and just make it more ethical. So, do you know what the three big issues in the textile industry are? Um, there's probably more than three, but um, one of the um, issues, obviously, is the uh, use of sweatshops. Another one is the um, use of chemicals in the production and also water. As I think I heard one of the young people over there talk about how much water it takes to, to make some of the garments. It also takes a lot of water to grow cotton. Uh, there's also lots of chemicals used in the production of um, fabrics from cotton. Leather is also another huge issue where there's uh, lots of chemicals used in leather manufacturing 
and um, the other is uh, waste. There's lots of issues around waste in the textile industry from the cutting room floor to what we do with our clothes once we're finished wearing them. Wow, sounds like a lot of issues in this industry. Um, do you guys have any questions that you want to ask? Right. Um, so, what do you think about this event so far? Do you think it's good for young people to know more about the environmental issues? Yes, I think this is a great event. We've been involved since its, since its conception and we find that um, the lots of young people that are coming through have come out of it with lots of extra knowledge that they didn't have before and we need these sorts of events for the schools within the within Sydney to come and learn more about environmental issues. Um, just give me your opinion. So what is your opinion on Western Sydney University's new logo? Unfortunately I'm not allowed to have an opinion about the new logo. And so I, I think that it's great that what we're doing and that it's um, making people more aware of our university within the West. So what, type, what kinds of chemicals do they use in the textile industry? There's so many that I just can't name them all, but um, a lot of the uh, chemicals are carcinogenic. And unfortunately, we don't have lots of choices with what chemicals are there. Different types of products use different types of chemicals. If it's a, um, a natural product, it uses different chemicals compared to synthetic products because synthetic products are basically um, the same uh, makeup of plastics. So obviously they're going to need different types of chemicals. A lot of the chemicals they use in the leather manufacturing can be carcinogenic. But unfortunately, until we have young people that are scientists and can come up with new ways of doing things, then we just have to keep doing it as best we can. That sounds like a great initiative. Um, so, hmm. So what? Can I ask you a question? Yes, you can ask me a question. Can I ask you a question? What do you What do you find is the best thing about this program, the Youth Eco Summit? Um, me personally, I feel like it's a great um, initiative from everyone that young people get to learn about more about the environment and what harms it and what what we can do for our part in this world. Yes. Actually, I think the same thing. I think our um, the kids of the uh, the next generation should learn and what it takes to save the environment and protect it for the future and the generation that comes after them. Um, I, I think the same as these guys. I mean, the next generation does need to know what goes into our clothing, the water, the chemicals, etc. Because if they don't, they're just going to think, well, I can keep buying these clothes and nothing's going to change. And we're not going to have these resources for very much longer to continue making these clothes that we do have. So, um, one last question. Do you know where people can find out more about these um, problems? Uh, well, obviously the internet is a great resource and there's lots of information on the internet. But there's also a wonderful movie that's been just produced called The True Cost. And that's all about the um, issues within the um, clothing industry. Awesome. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being Yes TV. Now back to Veronica and Aiden. Thank you, Chris. Our next guest will be BirdLife New South Wales. BirdLife New South Wales is a non-for-profit organisation that focuses on saving birds and bird watching. Here's an interesting fact about birds. Did you know that emus cannot walk backwards easily? This is why they are on the Australian coat of arms, to represent Australia continuously moving forward. This is why... oh jokes. Haha! <laughs> Another interesting fact. Did you know that the woodpecker can peck its beak out up to 20 times per second? Wow, really? That's uh, pretty fuss. I don't want that guy on my arm. Uh, it would be pretty hard writing my assignment for tomorrow. Now, I've got a pretty interesting fact. Did you know that Sydney has eagles? And no, I'm not talking about the team. Don't get any ideas. But let's over to Jennifer to learn about more. Oh, thank you, Veronica and Aiden. I have with me today BirdLife and what's your name? I'm Judy. Judy Harrington. Um, well, Good afternoon, Judy. Um, what do you have setting up there for us? Oh, I brought along a few different kinds of nests and a tawdy frog mouth to just give you some ideas of the kinds of nests that can be made and also how we might investigate 
predation, you know, has a go, who has a go at the nest, who, what the threats are. Now, you're speaking about these threats. What could they be? I'm sorry, I missed the question. Sorry. Yeah, you, you're speaking about these threats. What could these th be, threats be to these birds? Oh, all sorts of things. Life's pretty hard if you're a bird. For example, just behind the Discovery Centre, we actually have a tawny frog mouth, just like this is not real. I mean, it's real, but not alive. We do have a live one on a nest just behind the Discovery Centre. And it sits, the male sitting on the eggs right now to cover them, to keep them completely safe. Now, other birds might take them, they might be a threat, or it might just fall out of the nest. So it's keeping it quite safe. Could, could this bird essentially go into extinction one day, or is it pretty safe? It's pretty safe. There are actually quite a lot around, but there are many other birds that we also keep an eye on that are in much, much more um, danger of extinction or, or just very low numbers. What, what's, the ha what's the habitat like for these birds? This bird lives in the nature reserve woodland, which is just behind us in the forest. It's, it's actually a nature reserve because it's a special kind of forest called Sydney Turpentine Ironbark Forest, which is very little of it left in Sydney. Now, with their habitat, what do they like to eat or are they kind of a hunting bird? This is a nocturnal, a nighttime hunter, the tawny frogmouth. Um, their main food is all sorts of little insects, um, little mice, but mainly all kinds of insects and pests like cockroaches, so they actually do a really good job instead of sprays. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. Um, do you guys have any questions? All right, first of all, that bird looks very real, and I thought it was real. All right, how do these eagle um, cams work? Eagle cam, right, so I wish we could have another camera that, I wish we had another camera that was on the tawny frog mouth's nest, but you mentioned eagle cam. We do have a camera on the white-bellied sea eagles, which is probably four times as big as this with a two-metre wingspan, and they, in fact, have a nest in the same forest, and we do have a camera watching that nest and there are two young birds in the nest right now. Is there any predators that tend to hunt this bird? The, the eagles, the, the, the sea eagles, there's probably few predators here. Um, the main predator of them here is probably us people. But we've been watching on the nest and we've actually had some very interesting visitors on the nest. Um, night before there was a, a brush-tailed possum came to the nest. Now, when they were little chicks or when they were eggs, that would most definitely have been a threat. At the moment, it's probably more like to be food itself. Now, I just have one last question for you. Do you think this could really benefit the sea eagles, this eagle cam? Eagle cam is teaching us so much about the eagles. Um, and it will help what we learn, it will help to manage the eagles and their habitat in other places as well. So for protecting birds like um, in the forest with the nature reserve, all of these species are protected because it's restricted access. What we're learning about the eagles will help with conservation of the species all over Australia. Well, thank you for coming on Yes TV today. Um, we'll now head back to our anchors, Veronica and Aidan. Thanks, Jennifer. That was really interesting. Well, our next guest is from Stone and Bones. Here with him are some really cool stone tools that are made pretty much over thousands of years ago from the indigenous people. I'll now pass on to Eamon, who can find out more. But before we do that, what sort of tools did the Aboriginals use? What do you think? Well, I know they used boomerangs, and I'm pretty sure they used spears to get those kangaroos. I mean, they're pretty fast. Yeah, hoppity hop, hop, hop. But, uh... How would they make these tools? I mean, it's not like they got this big machine making it for them. They've got to do it by themselves. Well, they were pretty smart, so we'll see now how they managed to do this. All right, I'll now pass on to Eamon to find out more. Hello, my name is Eamon. Mind telling us your name? Uh, my name is David Harrington. Hello, David. Now, you have stone tools with you, and how efficient were these um, in, with uh, Aboriginals? Well, stone tools were a wonderful technology that was used by human beings and our ancestors. So things Homo erectus right back for about a million years. 
So obviously it was a very, very good type of technology because it was retained for so many, such a long period of time. Something a lot of people don't know is when white people first got here, they traded metal tools to a lot of the Aboriginal people, but then they found very quickly that they were actually not anywhere near as useful as the stone tools because they couldn't sharpen them because they were too hard and they didn't have anything to sharpen them on. So quite quickly they'd chuck their, stone, they'd chuck their metal axes away and go back to using stone axes. Yeah, actually, I agree with that. I've tried to sharpen a metal ruler before, but, you know, not useful. <laughs> anyway. Well, to sharpen a metal ruler, you need a file. Which is harder than it. There's a file. A file. Mind you giving us a demonstration? Well, I've got three different tool technologies here uh, from different parts of Australia. Uh, the first one... This is a, a knife made by a friend of mine, uh, a man called Jason Burrows, and he's a Nooka man from southwest Western Australia. So he's an Aboriginal man who lives in southwest Western Australia, and he's looking at the type of technology which is called resin. This, you can see this black stuff that's all around this knife. This is resin, and this resin comes from a tree called a grass tree or a xanthoria, which is a native type of tree. And when a bushfire comes through, all of this black stuff comes out of the bottom of the grass tree. And then what happens is the Aboriginal people used to collect it, grind it up, mix it with some stuff, including kangaroo poo, mix it up, the kangaroo poo makes it all stick together, and then they'd heat it up and bind it gradually and create this amazing stuff. Now have a feel of it. Is it hard? Wow, it's light, but the... The black stuff is actually strong. Yeah, it's really, really strong. It's basically like a natural plastic. And so what they do then is they would embed these piece, these flakes of very, very sharp material in it. Now this, have a look at it. What do you reckon it is? Does it look like stone or does it look like something else? Glass. It looks like stone to me. It's glass. It's a type of glass. So it's is everybody familiar, you know, like on telegraph lines, there's those big insulators that hold the um, lines and stop the electricity from electrocuting people? Well, that's what this is made out of. And when they first put the telegraph through, the Aboriginal mob down there quickly realised that that stuff was really useful. So they'd climb up the telegraph poles and steal them and smash them up to make stone tool to make tools out of. So that showed how clever they were. They would adapt their technology to whatever they could find around them. So yeah, this is made by Jason, and Jason's rediscovering and re reinventing a lot of these technologies over there in Western Australia. Very interesting. And now, what is that other tool that you have with you? So this is one of the most important tools in every man's toolkit, and this is a woomera. This is one from Central Australia, and you can see it's made from a number of different things. The end is our resin again. This is actually resin from a spinifex tree. The main part of it's made of timber. Beautiful timber in this case. And then at the end, you can see this little notch has been tied on with kangaroo sinew. So this is a string made out of the sinew, the material that comes out of inside a kangaroo's leg and lets him bounce up and down. And it's fantastic because it's really, really strong. And this is a spear thrower. So what you'd do is you'd have your spear, I should have brought a spear over. You put a, one end of the spear on there, you'd hold it along here, hold it in your fingers, bring it back like that, and then go like that. And this would be a big lever that enabled you to throw that spear a long, long way. So men used to be able to throw spears using this technology about 100 metres. And I worked with an old Aboriginal man up in the top end, and he could hit an emu in the eye, apparently at 100 metres away. So that was his little claim to fame, that he could hit an emu or a kangaroo right in the eye, so they were very, very good. But the other amazing thing about this tool is that it's multi-purpose, it's like a Swiss army knife. So you can see this bit's scooped, you can use it like a bowl to collect things. And on the bottom, you see this very sharp ridge, that's a fire lighter. So that's how you start your fire. So you'd have a piece of timber like this, and you'd use that sharp edge to rub backwards and forwards across it like that, and that would make hot sawdust, which would allow you to light fires. Right. Yeah, you go. Right, have you brought any other tools with you that Aboriginals could have used? 
Well, in my hand, I have a beautiful, beautiful stone axe head. Now, this one comes from Queensland, and it's intended to be put on the end of a handle and used to chop into trees so that you can climb up them to get possums out, maybe used to split out, split up a log so you can get to the honey or the witchetty grubs or whatever inside of it. But this has been made from a big flake of material off the side of a great big boulder of basalt. And then it's been ground down very, very carefully. And it's absolutely beautiful. You have a look how smooth and burnished it is. So that would have taken somebody a very long time. Well, this is very smooth, but it's not quite sharp. Well, that's because this is one that's been discarded. So they've used this. The edge has gotten all damaged and bashed away. So they chucked this one away and they've gone to make another one. So all of these tools and the things that I've got, some of them come from people who have given them to me. Others of them, Aboriginal communities I've worked with, have given them to me. And always what I like to do, it's because it's really important I share this information, but I have to ask permission. So I go to the Aboriginal people I work with and to the elders, and I ask them whether it's all right for me to talk about this type of material with school kids and that. Well, uh, now it's clearly that they say yes. Now, have a, now I think my friends have a, a question to ask. Um, so... Would the old um, Aborigines use these as weapons in the olden days? <laughs> well, most of these tools, some of them could be used as weapons and some of them were used dual purpose for, as maybe as weapons. But Aboriginal people in Australia were generally very peaceful. They didn't have war against one another like we think of war. They would very seldom would they go and actually just attack somebody any warfare and any conflict was normally as a result of problems between people. Somebody would have a conflict with somebody else and that might mean that they wanted to spear them or they wanted to knock them on the head or something. So yes, they were used in human conflict, but very much mostly they were used for interacting with, controlling and getting resources from the environment. And that's the most important thing. If you're living in the bush, and all you've got to survive is you've got to get from what's around you. You've got to have a very sophisticated and very carefully selected toolkit of materials so that you can take advantage of the environment around you. All right. Thanks, um, thanks for all that information. We're running out of time. So thanks for being on Yes TV with us. Hope we see you again. I'll now pass this back to Aidan and Veronica. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Eamon. That's all we have time for today. Thank you to our viewers here live at Sydney Olympic Park and our viewers online on YouTube. Unfortunately, Yes TV is over for today, but don't fear, it will be on tomorrow at the same time. Please join us at 12.30 p.m. and to the end to 1.30 p.m. on this YouTube channel. Have a great day. No, 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 Batman.